Thank you for joining our distinguished speaker series. Uh, we will be starting the presentation in um, around 10 minutes. So what do you have planned for tomorrow? The museum will be open. Um, uh, should be a pretty good day. Veterans Day, Memorial Day is always good for us as far as visitation. Um, the, the weather may impact a little bit. It's supposed to be wet, um, but mm -hmm. it's usually pretty good. Today was a really good day. It was pretty busy. Yeah, it was gorgeous around here, and you're right. At least in the D.C. area, it's supposed to rain most of tomorrow. Um, do you have dignitaries that will come out, and you do anything uh, special for Veterans Day? Or um, downtown, you usually do something. Um, get some bleed over from that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think probably the big day, big thing for tomorrow is going to be Namusa opening up. Um, so, and I'm not sure if they're doing the, well, obviously if it's raining, they're probably not going to do the parade, but they have had parades to downtown and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, we've, the parade was canceled this year. Yeah. Right. We have some more people coming into the webinar. Uh, thank you for joining. We will start in just about six minutes. More? Yeah. They're coming in. What's your uh, next writing project? Um, I have a whole bunch of ideas, but nothing um, nothing set in stone. Uh, one thing I'm working on, which is completely different, one of my uh, hobbies is music and playing guitar. And I befriended a, a professional guitar player who wants to write his, his memoirs. So we were in discussions of me helping him write that. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But I have all these ideas of other history books that I want to write about. And it's just hard right now because all the research facilities are closed. And um, right. So, and I don't know what the publishing world is like in terms of getting a contract and all of that. So I'm going to kind of relax for a while and then see uh, 
see how things progress into next year. Who's the guitarist? His name is Arlen Roth. He, um, do you play? I haven't for years. I used to, but. Do you I, remember a, a magazine called Guitar Player? Oh, yeah. I still got a bunch of them sitting yeah. around. A column for them and then he and his wife created a series called hot licks of um instructional videos vhs videos back in the day with a I number remember. of people and he's toured with simon and garfunkel and a number of other uh, john prine at one point a number of people well, he's had a somewhat distinguished career not right. you know, eric clapton or mark knopfler but He's pretty well known within the, the guitar community, and he's got lots of great stories. So we can get something going. I think it'll be an interesting book. Okay. What about yourself? Do you have any personal projects coming up? Um, no, our biggest thing right now is working on um, redo for the gallery here. Um, we just submitted the first draft for World War II, and then we're going to get into the Korea, Cold War, Vietnam. Um, so I'm just sitting down literally every day looking through Army's collection of artifacts, trying to pull different pieces in. Today I was looking for uh, World War One Third Army coats, uh, hats, mm. uh, or excuse me, helmets. Um, that's kind of a tie-in to uh, civil affairs, the beginning of that. And so uh, I'm looking for an example to maybe display. Uh, we're going to preempt with the little World War One, even though it's not in the storyline. But I think it'll be really interesting. We're going to tie it in and tie into the development of and use of parachute, uh, you know, early airborne in the sense of experimental and what it leads to the Mitchell. Um, yeah. Italians and the British wrap a little bit of that together and and uh, and hopefully pique some interest and so people don't realize and think that this just came out of a you know a flurry for World War II you know that it had some beginnings so uh, uh, might even throw a little tiny Broadwick in there. Um, Will you talk about Alvin York at all or? Uh, no, the eighty second Museum pretty much care of that so we're going to stay out of their lane okay um, yeah the i was there i was at the 82nd for a number of years before i moved over to asom so mm -hmm. uh, there's some neat york pieces there i know one of the uh um i believe it's his helmet went to namusa uh for exhibit um but we have his this post-world war his uh, uh coat that he had going on the uh uh, the bond tours and war bond and um, things like that. His honorary uh, colonel coat from the Tennessee Volunteer uh, is there. Um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty neat stuff. I've, I've worked with the York family before. We invited them out to Fort Bragg one year during All American Week. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, got to meet uh, the son and one of the, or one of the daughters and the sons. Uh, just a great family. Yeah, I met them once at a World War One Centennial Commission event, and uh, yeah, very neat people. We have Jim Bartlinski is viewing, um, and he said. Uh, thank you so much, Mitch and Jimmy, for doing this tonight. We're very really excited to have you. Well, good. I appreciate Jim uh, helping invite me to this. And um, one of my colleagues from the archives, Miriam Kleiman, is she on the? Um, is she on one of? Is she one of the folks on? Uh, I I don't believe so. Uh, not yet. Okay. She's friends with Jim, so she kind of uh, greased the skids for me. Awesome. Well, it is seven o'clock. So, uh, Renee, if you want to go ahead and start the introduction, I, I think we're ready to go ahead and start. <coughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Airborne and Special Operations Museum Foundation Distinguished Speaker Series.
These webinars are provided to museum members and guests as part of our mission to educate the public on military history, reflecting the efforts of the Airborne and Special Operations soldiers. This session will be recorded and posted to our website and social media platforms in the near future. Thank you for attending and watch for the next webinar scheduled for January when we will host author Josh Groen from the Netherlands, where he will discuss his book, Three of the Last World War II Screaming Eagles. Thank you to museum director Jim Bartlinski and for Abby Cashel, who is on the foundation staff for coordinating this event. I'll now turn over the program to Jimmy Hollis, curator at the ASOM and tonight's moderator. Thank you, Renee. So good evening, everyone. Uh, like Renee said, welcome to the U.S. Army Airborne Special Operations Speaker Series. Um, we're glad everybody wants to attend tonight. Uh, so tonight we, we welcome Dr. Uh, Mitchell Yockelson. Uh, he's a military historian and author of many books, uh, Borrowed Soldiers, Americans Under British Command, and 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the German Army in World War I. He has received the U.S. Army Historical Foundation's Distinguished Writing Award. He's a former professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. And he currently works at the National Archives and Records Administration as an investigative archivist. So tonight we're going to be talking about his latest book, The Paratrooper Generals, Matthew Ridgway, Maxwell Taylor, and the American Airborne from D-Day to Normandy. Uh, my name is Jimmy Hallis. I'm the curator at the U.S. Army Airborne Special Operations Museum. Some people call it ASOM. That's what we like. Um, and uh, I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, as Renee said, we also have us, with us Abby from our foundation. She's going to be assisting with questions from our social media sites. Uh, so welcome, Mitch. Pleasure to have you and looking forward to discussing the book. Well, thank you, Jimmy, and, and thank you, uh, Renee and Abby, for helping organize this and invite me. And to all of our uh, veterans who are now uh, tuning in or those that will watch the archive version of this program, um, I honor you and um, tomorrow being Veterans Day and I'll be, I'll be thinking about you. So it's apropos that we talk about the paratrooper generals and what the book is about and what I hope to convey to you in less than an hour this evening is about the two paratrooper generals, that would be Matthew Ridgway, who I think everyone is familiar with as commanding officer of the 82nd Airborne Division um, in World War II uh, through the Normandy campaign, and the 101st Airborne Maxwell Taylor. But I, not only do I want to talk about those two gentlemen who were the bravest of the brave, and the point of, I also want to talk about the airborne, whether it was the paratroopers or the glider uh, men who uh, served under them in both divisions and supported the divisions. And the point of the, the book is the fact that both uh, Ridgway and Taylor being commanding officers, major generals of the two divisions, they could easily and rightfully so have stayed behind the lines. They could have come over later on June 6th either by glider or they could have come in one of the landing craft onto Utah Beach. But they instead chose to drop with their men into Normandy, into harm's way. And that's kind of the theme of the book that sort of weaves around who these guys are, how they got to be where they were in terms of commanding officers of these divisions, and what happens to them, not just on June 6th, but through the middle of July, the, the Normandy campaign. And, and often when we think about D-Day, June 6th, we think about, okay, it was one day in history, a one day of importance, and then that was it. But in actuality, that was only one day of a long slugfest of a campaign. And both the 82nd and the 101st were in the thick of it. So let's uh, move on to the next slide, please. In the early morning hours, just about a quarter to 12, um, double standard time in England, meaning it was still light, 
Maxwell Taylor left an air base in southern England. He flew in a C-47, just like all the other paratroopers, the, all the other 13,000 American airborne who came uh, from England and flew to Normandy. And he uh, flew in a C-47, and I'll show you an image of the C-47 shortly, in what they called a stick, the group of men anywhere from about 17 to 18. Taylor, the first time he had ever jumped, he learned how to be a paratrooper, even though he commanded the division, and we'll talk about how he ended up there. About 15 minutes or so later, General um, Matthew Ridgway also took off from uh, southern England aboard a C-47 along with a stick of paratroopers from the 82nd Division and jumped into Normandy. The experience of both Taylor and Ridgway were pretty similar. In the case of Taylor, he would write in his memoirs that he came down with a bag. He landed in a small field close by one of the famous Normandy hedgerows. And if any of the audience has been to Normandy, you know what I mean? There are these natural barriers that um, were built to keep cattle and to separate fields and orchards and so forth. It was pitch black when Taylor landed. And he looked around. The original plan was that he would be landing with um, the stick of his men in the same drop zone area. But instead, he landed by himself. And the only thing that he saw was a cow. And the cow looked at him. Taylor looked at the cow. And he was relieved because the cow meant that there weren't any Germans around. Had there been, um, he would have been killed instantly because that, that cow would have been also sacrificed in the fighting. A little bit later, the same thing happens to Ridgeway. He recalls that his descent was fast, but he landed on a nice, soft, grassy field. He too was alone and he grabbed his 45 pistol, but he didn't grab it uh, well enough because it slipped from his hands and fell onto the ground. Eventually he got it. Both officers cut their way out of their parachute straps and tried to figure out where they were heading in the dark. Taylor had, and I'll show you the famous um, little airborne uh, clickers that were used as um, for um, orchestras, for keeping time. And he clicked and he got a response back once his men came. Ridgeway decided not to use that. In fact, most of the 82nd felt that they were unnecessary, we were gonna fall out of the uniforms. But once these two officers landed, their job was only beginning. It was to rally their troops who were scattered hither and yon and bring them to the designated command post areas. And this again is in the early morning hours of June 6. The Germans are all around and there are planes flying up ahead. They're scattering of machine guns, small arms fire, flak, the noise, the chaos. You could only imagine how hectic it must have been. But these men rallied their troops and they began their mission. Let's talk about in the next slide who the airborne were, who were these men, how did they get started, and how did they end up in Normandy? The gentleman to the left um, is at the time General uh, William Bill Lee. He's from Dunn, North Carolina. So anybody that's down in the Fayetteville area knows that Dunn, a small town, is not far away. In fact, there's a wonderful museum dedicated to Bill Lee on a nice little um, country street in the small town, something right out of um, you know our town, Thornton Wilder. But Lee was is considered the father of the airborne. Like so many officers, including both Ridgway and Taylor, he was a protege of George C. Marshall, who at the time uh, before the war and certainly through World War II was the Army's brilliant chief of staff. And it was through Marshall that Lee was encouraged to start organizing the airborne. And this started around 1939, right when World War II started, and but well before the United States was in the war. And he was told to organize 
groups organize a training program. And one of the things that he did during a trip to New York City in 1939 for the World's Fair, the photograph that I, I show you on the far right is of the um, one of the parachute towers that was down at Camp Benning, later Fort Benning in Georgia. This is where the paratroopers uh, trained. But Lee had seen the same thing as a ride up in uh, Coney Island. It's now located, but in the World's Fair, you could pay probably 25 cents if you were brave enough, didn't have too many hot dogs and ice cream, go all the way to the top and then jump down. And he thought that would be a brilliant exercise for the paratroopers. Eventually, the paratrooper school was established. Uh, it was four weeks. And to become a paratrooper was strictly volunteer. As the Army started to build up in 1939, 1940, and then certainly in 1941, after December 7th, when we got into the war, it was realized through Marshall that we needed to have a paratrooper contingent. We didn't have a division yet. The 82nd hadn't been born just yet, but slowly building up the paratroopers. And so they were all volunteers. You had to have low blood pressure. You could only be, you could have um, certain, your eyesight had to be good. You had to be rugged in good physical condition. And in order to recruit paratroopers, the army would send um, officers to the various training camps and try and get infantry who were already in the army to join up. One other way was the poster in the middle um, that was designed by an artist uh, by the name of Steele. And they placed these posters all around, not only in army bases, but in civilian areas. In fact, one of the paratroopers that I talk about in the book recalls he was from Kentucky and he was visiting Cincinnati one day and he was coming out of the post office. And that same poster was on a uh, post near the post office. And he saw it and he looked at that soldier looking brave with the parachutes jumping behind him and saying to him directly, become a paratrooper, jump into the fight. Well, he did, and so did thousands of other young soldiers. So they would go through this four weeks of training, rigorous physical conditions. And if you've ever been to Georgia, especially around Columbus, Georgia, where Benning is located, in particular in the summer when it's hot and swampy, it wasn't a pleasant experience. But the men went through with the goal of learning to be paratroopers. And once you got to be a paratrooper and you graduated and you could make your jumps both during the day and in the evening at night, because they knew that part of the tactics of a paratrooper was to jump in the darkness. You were awarded your paratrooper badge, but most importantly to these guys, you got your paratrooper boots. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the formation of the 82nd. The 82nd Division, as we all know, um, was formed in World War I in 19, late 1917, and then in 1918, it was part of General Pershing's American Expeditionary Forces. And the, the uh, hero of World War I was a member of the 82nd Division, Alvin York, from the Valley of the Five Forks in, in Tennessee. Well, the division after World War I, like most of the Army divisions, um, was, uh, was basically held back and wasn't a true division. But once we got into the war and Marshall and the um, Army ground forces started organizing, the 82nd was one of the divisions to call back. And as Lee was forming the uh, paratroopers, it was decided that the 82nd should become an airborne division. Well, Matthew Ridgway, the son of an army colonel, he was born down in Fort Monroe, um, Virginia in um, 1895, had never been someone who thought about jumping out of an airplane. That just seemed you know, ludicrous to him. But when the idea came up, hey, do you wanna be commander of a division? it's gonna be an airborne division. Well, for a number of years, Ridgway, who had a distinguished career at this point, he had graduated West Point in 1917. He had gone back to West Point to teach. 
he, during World War I, much to his regret, he never made it over to France. He was actually on the Mexican border. But right around the time of the First World War, he was serving directly under Marshall on the War uh, Plans Division staff. Marshall knew how bad he wanted a division command and placed him assistant commander of the 82nd under Omar Bradley, who would go on to lead the First Army. Um, eventually, when uh, Bradley got promoted, so did Ridgeway, and he becomes the commander of the 82nd Division, and he's got to train these guys how to be airborne troops. So what happens is he um, basically inherits a bunch of airborne regiments that had trained at Fort Benning, and they've got to figure out how many men and so forth. Next slide, please. Serving under Ridgeway is Maxwell D. Taylor. Now, Taylor, the, uh, from Missouri, the son of a country lawyer, also a West Point grad, five years junior to Ridgeway, had also never considered what airborne was. Now, we knew about airborne even before World War II. Dating back to World War I, a guy named Billy Mitchell, perhaps you've heard of him, more because he was uh, court-martialed in 1924 for insubordination. But Mitchell being an aviator and command of the American Expeditionary Forces First Army um, Aviation and de facto commander of the AEF Aviation had come up with an idea of dropping troops behind the German lines. He presented the idea to General Pershing who listened but the problem was we didn't have enough airplanes. We didn't have enough airplanes in for our own just aviation, much less for dropping men behind the lines. We certainly didn't have the parachutes. And so Mitchell's call for airborne back in World War I went unheeded. But slowly it would develop. And um, Taylor would become the chief of staff under Ridgeway and eventually would be promoted as the artillery commander of um, the 82nd Division. Now, Ridgeway and Taylor knew each other, of course. The Army was pretty small before the war. They had attended a class together um, at uh, Benning as part of the um, Army school, but they weren't what you would call friends. They didn't run in the same circles, and even later in life, um, after Normandy, when they both were promoted, um, of course, uh, Ridgeway would take over uh, the command of uh, MacArthur's UN forces in Korea. Later on, Taylor would become an advisor to President Kennedy during the Vietnam War. They associated, but they were never, never close individuals. But Why do Taylor you think that was, Mitch? About a, I'm sorry? Why do you think that was? Really? I think it was just, um, I think it was the age, but also um, it just wasn't commonplace to have, um, you know, the major general and the brigadier general as friends. And Taylor looked up to Ridgeway quite a bit. In fact, he tells in his uh, memoirs that when he was first came to Louisiana, where the 82nd was training, he was amazed of the physical condition that Ridgeway was in, being five years older than him. Ridgeway, he hardly could keep up with him as he went from one end to the training camp to the other to inspect the troops. And Ridgeway um, taught Taylor quite a bit. And as we'll talk about shortly, he was instrumental in getting um, Taylor a uh, command of the 101st Airborne. Next slide, please. So what happens is, um, as we get into 1942 and we're slowly building up our forces and the cadres for each of the divisions, the tables of organization, and all of these sorts of things are being formed, it's recognized that we're going to need more than one airborne division. At this point, the Germans have showed uh, a great prowess in using the airborne. Uh, whether it was in uh, the Netherlands, whether it was in Greece, and the British, of course, had also used the airborne. And so 
Marshall knew that we had to build up our airborne forces. He didn't know exactly when and where we were going to use them, but they were going to be an important component for the U.S. Army as we were starting to send troops to North Africa and into the Middle East and also into the Pacific Theater, which we won't discuss this evening. So the idea then became to split up the 82nd Airborne into two divisions. And the next number that came up in the Army um, system for a division was the 101st. And the logical guy to lead the 101st was Bill Lee. He had been somewhat disappointed that he hadn't got tapped to lead the 82nd, the position that um, Ridgeway took over. But Lee was important in terms of training. He had gone overseas and had um, observed the British. And it was important for him, Marshall thought, to stay back in the US. But now that we had this division, Bill Lee would become um, now the division commander. So in August of 1942, he starts training um, the division and they would um, end up also training in Benning, but in North Carolina and elsewhere in the South. And eventually the division would ready itself for um, operations in Europe later on. In the meantime, the 82nd is tapped in 1943 to go to the Mediterranean Theater. And that's his first combat, which is in Italy and then Sicily. And things don't go very well. The troops are in, in Sicily. It didn't. I'm sorry? Not in Sicily, it didn't. No, certainly in Sicily, it did not go very well. There was a horrible incident of friendly fire where a number of 82nd Airborne paratroopers were killed by um, ground fire um, from the U.S., um, I should say from the naval ships, not exactly ground fire, but from the sea. Troops were landing far away from the drop zones. Before we get the term LGOPs, right? Yeah, exactly. And we'll right. talk a little bit about the, uh, the Pathfinders um, later on, which is a result of what happened in Italy and Sicily. In 1943, we started thinking about how we're going to support the other allies. And one of the ideas, of course, is the liberation of Europe. The U.S. wanted to strike at the Germans in Europe. The British, on the other hand, who had been fighting the Germans a lot longer than the United States, were a little bit reluctant. They wanted to kind of attack the Germans piecemeal. They were already fighting them in North Africa. They had fought them in Greece. They thought by encircling them, that would be the way to go. But General Marshall and his protege, another one, um, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, who is in the Mediterranean theater and served quite ably in North Africa, they're coming up with a plan to eventually strike at the Germans in France by an amphibious landing from England. It's not exactly decided yet whether that's going to be across the English Channel from Dover to the Pas de Calais, which is the shortest distance between the two countries in the Channel, or go through Normandy, or even go through Norway. So all of this is in the planning stage. But both the 82nd and the 101st are planning because it's thought that they're going to play a major role in the operation that would, of course, become um, Overlord. In the meantime, Bill Lee is commanding the unit, and they get deployed overseas to England to start training. We get into 1944, and Overlord, the planning and the training and so forth has really kicked in. Bill Lee, though, has a horrible um, heart condition. He had had one heart attack already, and on one of the days he's out visiting his unit, he's with a, a glider officer, and he starts grabbing his chest, and he passes out. He's rescued. He's brought to one of the Army hospitals, but he's in pretty bad shape. And at this point, Eisenhower, who's in command of Operation Overlord, of all of the Allied forces in Europe, 
doesn't want to risk um, Lee continuing on as a division commander. He's just in rough shape. In fact, eventually he would get sent back to um, the United States. And if you ever visit the um, Bill Lee Museum in Dunn, they have a wonderful collection of letters that uh, Lee had written to his wife while he was in the hospital in England, also when he got back to the US. And that includes letters from Eisenhower and Marshall and others who were checking up on him. So now the question is, who's going to replace Lee as commander of the 101st Airborne? Well, there are a number of considerations, um, including Anthony uh, McAuliffe, who is a distinguished artillery officer. But Ridgway, who trained essentially uh, Maxwell Taylor, likes him and thinks he would be the most capable. And he puts the bug in Ike's ear. Ike had met Taylor at one point while they were both in Washington before being deployed when Taylor was part of the uh, War Plans Division and um, um, Eisenhower had been brought over from a command and getting ready to be deployed overseas and they met briefly. Eisenhower heard a lot about Taylor and selected him as the division commander. So he would take over and it was not an easy transition because Bill Lee was incredibly well liked by the men of the 101st, the Screaming Eagles. But Taylor, who was a lot more soft-spoken, but uh, also someone who was very um, by the book. And um, it took a while for the Screaming Eagles to adjust to Taylor's, um, how should we say, his command style. So, Mitch, was there anything that Taylor did during the war before he was selected that might have given him a little edge over some of the other guys? Um, during the, yeah, it's an excellent point, uh, Jimmy. During the Italian campaign, he was sent on a secret mission to uh, essentially get the Italians on the side of the Allies in, in hopes of um, getting them away from the Germans. And there was this whole plan, and I, I, I'll just tease you a little bit about it because I go into it in a little bit of detail in the book, and I want everybody to read the book. But it's, it was a secret mission. And the one thing about um, Taylor that I haven't mentioned yet, that he was fluent in foreign languages. He was yeah. definitely fluent in Japanese, but he was able to understand other languages, including Italian. So he was perfect for this secret mission. He and another officer snuck into um, Rome in the early hours and orchestrated this whole sort of mission to get the Italians on the Allied side. And that's all I'm going to say for right now. Thanks. But uh, Eisenhower also recognized what Taylor had done there and thought, again, highly of him. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about Operation Overlord, but specifically Operation Neptune. Now, Neptune is part of Overlord. Overlord, for those of you, just as a refresher, is the code name for the Allied operation to attack the Germans um, in Europe. And it was decided early on in 1944 that indeed we would cross the English Channel and attack the Germans on the Norm Normandy coast. So a whole elaborate scheme though was set up as a deception to get the Germans to think that we were gonna do the shorter route, which was, as I mentioned, from Dover onto the Pas de Calais. But Normandy was where the, the troops were gonna be landing and they would land by uh, seaborne, of course, through the landing ships but an important component, especially after Utah Beach, which was the westernmost beach, was added. And it was realized during the planning that in order to break through the Utah Beach, it was necessary to have an airborne component. If you've been to Utah Beach, you know that a lot of the terrain is heavily flooded. There are causeways that go from the beaches onto the open land. It kind of reminds you of Southern Florida around Miami with all of those causeways. And so 
the plan was to put the airborne under the U.S. 7th Corps, which was going to be led by General J. Lawton Collins, old Lightning Joe uh, Collins. And there would be two components of it. The 82nd, which would be their plan, would be codenamed Boston, and the 101st uh, would be named Al Albany. And so the idea of landing at Utah Beach was to get troops, the landing troops, ashore as quick as possible. And that would be the 4th Infantry uh, Division. And then once they got ashore, they would team up with the um, landing beach, Omaha, which was going to be directly to the east of them. And then they would all start heading in to the capture of Cherbourg, which was a coastal city in Normandy. And one of the most important parts about Operation Overlord was not only getting the troops, whether it was through the air or, um, or on the beaches by the landing craft, but was to establish a port. Once we got all of the troops, Eisenhower recognized we needed to have a port. We needed to bring supplies over because hopefully it was going to be a rapid movement through uh, Europe and um, heading east in basically breaking through the German position. So we had to have a major port and Cherbourg was going to be it. So not only when the troops were going to land, the airborne now, the 82nd and the 101st, their job was to secure the roads and the bridges that uh, were uh, directly related to inland from Utah Beach. And that would help facilitate the 4th Division, the ground troops. They would do so also by disrupting the Germans. It was hoped that the deception would fool the Germans so when the airborne troops, which were going to come in in the middle of the night, they would uh, surprise the Germans. There would be so much confusion that the airborne was essentially just mow over them. And then eventually, early in the morning, they would link up with the 4th Infantry Division. And as we'll discuss momentarily, those plans went fairly well, but not entirely as, as they had hoped. Let's go to uh, the next slide. So in order to get the troops over there, you, you had to fly them. And that was under the responsibility of Lieutenant General Lewis H. Brereton. Brereton actually started out as a naval officer, a graduate in 1911 of Annapolis, uh, which is actually just down the street from where I live and where I taught for a number of years. And then like a lot of officers, he, um, joined the army because he wanted to become an aviator, exciting, the Knights of the Air. And he became an aviator. He served under Billy Mitchell in World War I and eventually would move through the ranks. Uh, Brereton and Mitchell um, had a lot in common. Apparently, they were both very arrogant guys, womanizers, who thought they knew everything about the army. But Brereton was pretty smart. He had served both in the Far East and the Mideast before taking over the 9th Carrier Command. The Carrier Command would be extremely important, not only in Europe, but of course, also in the Pacific Theater as well. In fact, in his memoirs, Crusade to Europe, General Eisenhower would recognize the uh, Carrier Command as one of the five pieces of military essential to, to defeating the uh, Germans. Next slide, please. Getting them to Europe from England was the Douglas C-47 Skytrain. Uh, this was an aircraft that was originally the DC-3. It was a civilian aircraft used in hopes of developing a um, commercial um, you know, industry of flying Americans around the U.S. and overseas. We take that for granted, at least before the pandemic, but this was really um, in the um, infancy. The Army, including uh, the British and the Russians, would see the DC-3, and they asked the Army to convert these into military use. It was a brilliant plane. It was designated the C-47 
They were made um, in Long Beach, uh, California, also outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and later on a couple of other factories. But you can see from the statistics I provide, it went 230 miles an hour. It could have a 1600 mile range. Huge wings, 96, in, uh, 96 feet, uh, 63 inch, um, I'm sorry, that should be 63 feet uh, length, not inches, 18,000 pounds. And it had two of the best engines around at the time. It's still considered some of the best, two 1200 horsepower Pratt and Windy, um, Pratt and Whitney's. Next, please. Later on, once the paratroopers were dropped by the C-47, the Army needed to bring over supplies. They needed to bring over jeeps. They needed to bring over artillery, signal supplies, medical supplies. So the gliders would play an essential role. And the Americans developed their own. Um, it was known as the WACO. It was developed by the Weaver Aircraft Company in Ohio. And eventually Weaver would subcontract out to another a uh, number of other airline um, manufacturers. It was a flimsy plane like all gliders in the day. It held two crew, had a wingspan of almost um, 84 feet, and the stall speed, once it broke away from the cable that was carried by a C-47, went at 49 miles per hour. And the idea was that it would glide down and bring crew, including officers and equipment. As much as the Americans liked the WACO, they also liked another one, a British. Next slide, please. Oh, real quick question for you, Mitch. When the C-47 is towing the glider over, at what point and how is it released? There is a cable um, that's um, that's um, inside where the pilots are of the C-47, and they had the controls on one end and then the glider pilots on the other. So they would have a uh, basically a signal and the uh, cable would snap away from the glider and essentially it was on its own. And we'll talk just a little bit about some of the trouble those things ran into in a moment. But some right. of the American uh, glider pilots preferred the Horsa essentially because it was a lot, much larger glider. You could get more men, more equipment in there at a larger wingspan and can carry up to 30 armed troops. So the Americans primarily used the WACOs, but they also, some of the units also of the 82nd and 101st used the horses as well. Which one was more durable? Uh, they were both uh, pretty much the same. Both of them, if they ran into trouble, they both crashed. They were kind of like the balsa wood planes that all of us played with as kids. Once right. they, uh, you let go and threw them, they were pretty much on your own. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if there was really a difference of which ones broke apart more. Now the horses were predominantly wood, right? Yeah, they were both, yeah, wood and the uh, Wacos had the, the cloth around, a metal frame, uh, but also some wood as well. Okay. Uh, next slide. Well, it sounds like they wouldn't stand up very well to some hedgerows. No, no, and then that's exactly what happened. So as we get into 1944, and essentially we get into the late spring, the original plan for Overlord was going to be in May of 1944. However, planning, uh, Eisenhower realized we needed more time, and also a lot of this depended on the weather, the tides, and so forth. So the date was changed until um, June the 5th of 1944. And as we got closer, of course, the weather was horrible and we had to change the date and June 6th would become D-Day. But during this time, as the planning was going on, especially with the airborne, there was a lot of tension between Omar Bradley, who I introduced you to before as the original commander of the 82nd, he would become commander of the First Army, which under um, which the Seventh Corps would be attached to. And so both Ridgeway and Taylor essentially reported to Brad. And where the problem was, was Trafford Lee Mallory. 
Sir Trevor Lee Mallory was a brilliant British air officer who Eisenhower selected as his air chief marshal. Uh, Mallory, Lee Mallory had been well known for his work during the Battle of Britain to help keep the Germans at bay from completely destroying England. Lee Mallory was worried about the airborne, not only the American, the two divisions, but also the British 6th Airborne that was gonna come over on the same day in a different part of Normandy. He thought that the airborne, they were gonna be sitting ducks, that they were gonna be shot out of the sky. He was predicting anywhere from 50 to 70% casualties. And he literally begged Eisenhower to drop the airborne component of Overlord. Well, Bradley, who was responsible for Utah Beach, the westernmost beach, said, there is no way we can bring troops ashore on Utah Beach without having the airborne there opening up the causeways and the, securing the bridges. And so they battled back and forth. And it was ultimately Eisenhower's decision. And even as late as May, uh, towards the end of May, in fact, when the Americans learned that a German division had been deployed right in the heart of where the 82nd was going to jump, um, Trafford Lee Mallory was really pushing Eisenhower to drop the airborne. He went to visit Eisenhower in Portsmouth, where Eisenhower had his so-called circus tent. Eisenhower said, I need a little bit of time to discuss this and think it over. And eventually Eisenhower said, I'm gonna go with the airborne. And Trafford Lee Mallory lost out on this, but uh, later on after the airborne landed and the casualties were nowhere as high as Lee Mallory had predicted, he would apologize to Eisenhower for really pressuring him and, and pushing him. Do you think, um... Uh, Lee Mallory was concerned that the seaborne troops were going to get to the airborne guys in time. When you jump, you have limited supplies. And well, yeah, that was part of a tough situation. Yeah, no, that's a good point. He was also more concerned with when they were flying over Normandy with the German flak. And once the Germans recognized that the um, planes were there, the airborne, that they were just going to shoot these guys out of the sky. And then when the gliders came later on, they would be completely destroyed as well. And I've had the question posed to me is, well, was, was Lee Mallory too British centric? Was he, did he dislike the Americans? And, and that certainly is not the case. He was you know? just very concerned about the men and it had nothing to do with, well, I don't want the Americans um, gathering any kind of glory. It was just more of a concern about the operation. And I kind of got that sense reading the book. I, I wasn't sure if it was a concern that they would be destroyed in the air or I wasn't sure of the American forces, airborne forces, because it seems like we started late. You know, the British had already developed, other countries had already done it. We were kind of playing catch up and he might have been a little concerned and the Americans pull this off. Well, that, that certainly was on his mind, but he was also concerned about his British troops who had had more experienced, a little bit more, not a lot more than the Americans. It was just the whole idea of sending the largest airborne contingent so far in the war into a war zone right in the heart of German territory. He thought a complete disaster. Bradley, on the other hand, and he received uh, uh, support from uh, General Montgomery, the British ground commander, that he also supported the paratroopers. And so all of that weighed heavily on Eisenhower, who at this point was smoking about three packs of cigarettes a day, reading a lot of dime novels. It was extremely nervous. He decided to go with the airborne. Uh, next slide, please. So readying for takeoff. It's now almost D-Day. And on June the 5th, the paratroopers are all have all been in a marshalling area in England where they've been trained and trained and retrained on where they're going to land and what they're going to do once they land. And these marshalling areas are large sand tables based on reconnaissance photographs that show them what the terrain is like. 
And as they line up to go aboard the C-47s, they're handed their equipment. And that included what I have on the list here, and I'll just go through it very quickly. They had the May West flotation devices. Now, these were life vests that ballooned up and looked like uh, May West, the famous film screen star of the day. Um, they, of course, had maps. They were given French francs in case they got into trouble, were captured, and had to bribe French citizens to get them out of trouble. Hand grenades, compasses, rifles, machine guns, pistols, first aid kits. And the Americans carried two parachutes, their regular, their main parachute, and a reserve. The British only had the main. So if the main didn't uh, deploy, you were pretty much in trouble if you were a British paratrooper. Also, was there enough time for them to deploy a reserve? Probably not. Um, right. You pretty much had to be trained and hope for the best that you packed your parachute very, very carefully. Some of the paratroopers brought some of their own equipment, including knives that they tucked into their paratrooper boots. Um, one paratrooper bought a couple of uh, bottles of Schlitz beer along with him. Um, Taylor also brought a little flask of. Um, of booze with him. So just anything to, to ease their nerves. Sounds like an American paratrooper. Yeah, exactly. Next slide, please. So on the way to Normandy, the troops had a pre-designated route. Once they took off, they rendezvoused in um, via Vs. The planes would all fly together, kind of like a flock of birds. They would circle over a designated point in England and eventually they would fly over the coast, again, where they would rendezvous. And there were various lights from British ships along um, areas along the coast that would take them on a southern route and eventually over the Isle of Wight on their way towards Nor Normandy. And the, the planes themselves, originally when they first took off, they were about a thousand feet um, in the air. But as they got closer to Normandy, they had to descend fairly quickly and much lower to about three to 400 feet, which meant, going back to your question about the parachutes, there was very little room for error. Once you jumped out of that plane, once you were given the signal, you didn't have a lot of time to deploy the chute and to land. It's the uh, paratroopers were also given seasickness pills, and most of them smoked along the way. Some of them slept. Taylor was so nervous that he stood up and looked out the hatch door, which was open. And he could right. see the landing ships as they were coming from um, England towards uh, Utah Beach and to Omaha Beach. Next slide, please. The Pathfinders. Because of the issues that the 82nd Airborne had in Italy, the fact that many of them landed miles and miles away from the drop zone. Um, General James Gavin, who I'll introduce you to in a moment, came up with the idea of pathfinders. So these were specially trained paratroopers who would land about a half an hour before the main body of the paratroopers, and they would have with them compass beacons, colored panels, colored smoke, and the Eureka radar sets. All of this was set against similar equipment in the C-47s. And that way, as the pilots got closer to the drop zones, they'd know where they were and they could time it so when the paratroopers would get ready to drop. This was more of a signal beacon, right? I'm sorry? More of a signal beacon. It can it, they were homing yeah, in, right? Signal beacon that was inside the C-47 would get activated by uh, the beacons, the compass beacon that were on the ground. Plus, they could see the panels. So the so the pathfinders would land just like the paratroopers did later on. They would deploy all of this equipment, and then they would form up and become infantry, just like the paratroopers who would come right after them. The first pathfinder to land in Normandy was an American by the name of Captain Frank Lilliman. He was from Skinny Adelie's New York, a big cigar smoker who supposedly was smoking a cigar as he jumped out of his plane into Normandy. 
his Pathfinder unit was fairly successful in laying their equipment. Some of the other Pathfinder units for both the 82nd and the 101st ran into trouble immediately. That was the first signal to the Germans that the paratroopers were actually coming. Now, the Germans in the early hours of June 6 didn't know if the paratroopers, if this was actually a diversion, was the so-called fake news and the main body of the attack was going to be elsewhere in France or was right. this going to be it? So once the, uh, the Pathfinder started landing, that signaled the Germans that something was up. Next slide, please. So the airborne drop zones in Germany were based around uh, the rivers, the Mare de Ray, uh, and um, elsewhere. And the 82nd had their drop zones, 101st, because they each had different missions, similar missions, but different areas to liberate. Waiting for them in that area of Normandy were four of the best German units. Most of them had come from the Eastern Theater. Some of them included Russian soldiers who had been captured, given the choice of either going to, to POW camps or becoming German soldiers. Meanwhile, we know about the Atlantic Wall, these heavily defensive areas that were under that were built under command of General Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox from North Africa. Rommel, who wasn't certain where the landing was going to be, had heavily, excuse me, heavily fortified Normandy. And one of the defensive devices that he constructed through through French labor were the so-called asparagus, Rommel's asparagus, these long, tall poles of, made of wood that would catch both the gliders, in some cases, the parachutes, and trap the parach parachutists as they came in. They were in areas, a lot of the uh, ground was flooded by the Germans. So even though the Germans didn't entirely know that where an attack was going to come, they knew an attack was going to come, they were ready for the Allies. Now, some of the, the Rommel's asparagus, did they mine that and booby trap those so when they would, the paratroopers would come down, they would trip some of those things? Absolutely. They were mined. They had wires that ran. They looked like telephone poles. When you see in a, in a suburban street, you know, one after the other with the wires on top, at least the older neighborhoods now, of course, we have that underground. But they would trip one and go to the other. And um, it could be a true nightmare for the paratroopers. Right. Next slide. So the troops begin landing, including Taylor and Ridgeway in the early hours of June 6. The Pathfinders have laid down as best they can of where the C-47s are supposed to drop the men. But as I briefly mentioned earlier, all these plans didn't necessarily go um, the way they were supposed to. And many of the men were scattered among those hedgerows. They were in cow pastures, they were in villages, and unfortunately, a number of troops, including a large um, body of uh, 82nd Airborne, all Americans, landed in some of the marshes. With all the equipment that I showed you, these guys weighed almost 200 pounds, so when they landed in the marshes, they went directly under the water, and many of the men were drowned. Some of them landed anywhere from 10 to 20 miles from the drop zones. But what's miraculous in using the um, the crickets, as they called them, the image I have on the far right there, those toy crickets, which you could buy in every gift shop in Normandy now, you would click once. And then if you were by one of your allies, they would click twice to say that they were allied soldiers. If you didn't get that click twice, and you got nothing. You knew German soldiers were nearby. As the morning went on and in daylight, miraculously the the american troops were able to regroup even despite the fact that so many of them were so scattered from their from where their units had landed next slide the, the 101st had the crickets did the 82nd have crickets as well or the 82nd they uh, use? were issued crickets but they decided not to use them um Ridgeway felt, and, and Gavin also felt, that they were going to fall out of their uniforms and they would be worthless. Um, so it was mainly the men of the 101st Airborne who used the crickets. 
I noticed Lighter. in the book you talk about the 82nd using uh, uh, challenge and, and passwords. Exactly. So they had the passwords down, and the 101st also had the password, but they also used those those crickets as well to determine whether it was friend or foe. Uh, quickly about the gliders. They became known as the flying coffins. We talked about this a little bit early, how flimsy they were. They're fabric covered. They're towed at about 130 miles on a 300 foot, one inch nylon rope. And then once they were released by the C 47s, lots of turbulence. There were um, six glider missions, four of them on D Day, Chicago, Detroit, Keokuk, and Elmira. And then the 82nd had two more on June the 7th. On June the 6th, the assistant commander under Maxwell Taylor, General Don Pratt, was killed in a glider crash. His glider was coming in. It took heavy flak. It skidded along the ground and ran into the hedgerows and eventually the trees. Uh, Pratt, along with the two uh, crew members, he was sitting in a Jeep with another officer and all four of them were killed. Pratt would be the highest ranking officer killed on June 6. Next slide, please. So as the men uh, started to regroup, the two main missions on June 6 of for the 82nd, the All-Americans, was to liberate Saint-Marie-Glise and also the Lafayette uh, Causeway Bridge. Both of those uh, proved to be costly and take much longer than they planned. Some miracle the town that straddled the main highway leading towards Cherbourg was especially um, important. And the airborne uh, units attacked early in the day. They took the town by the late morning, but the Germans counterattacked. And by the afternoon, it was back in German hands. And not until late in the day, had the American, the 82nd Airborne, liberated Saint Maragles. Saint Maragles is also well known. There had been a fire early in the morning, right as the Airborne were landing. It's believed that one of the Allied planes, uh, one of its bombs, had um, dropped out and hit one of the buildings, causing the uh, the town to go basically in flames. Some of the airborne troops landed in the flames and were killed. Many of them landed in the town square. The image I show here of the church and the church steeple, if anybody has seen uh, the movie, and I'm sure you have The Longest Day or read the brilliant book, you know that um, a paratrooper was caught on the steeple. At least that's the story. Uh, Red Buttons plays that paratrooper in the movie. You have the image of the 82nd Airborne guys with their German uniforms and captured Nazi flags proudly by the end of June 6. While this is fighting is going on, next slide, please. The other, the rest of the 82nd are having a heck of a time fighting at La Fiere, which is only a few miles away. Also an important causeway leading from Utah Beach. By early morning, the 4th Infantry Division is starting to come ashore. And it's important that the Americans open up and get the causeways available for them to go inland. James Gavin is an interesting uh, figure in American military history. He is somebody that early on wanted to be in the airborne. Just very quickly about him, he was an orphan from Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania. He was adopted by a family. Um, and you know, apparently it was a very rough going. Uh, Gavin would write later on that he suffered severe physical abuse from his stepmother, so bad that at, one, at age 17, he left home, ran away, went to New York City, knew no one there, had very little money, wandered the streets, couldn't find a job, eventually was shown some mercy by an army recruiter, and Gavin would go into the army even at a too young of an age. An attorney would sign for him, and he's shown an aptitude as being a soldier. He would take the um, the test for West Point, get into West Point, graduate, and that's where he learned about the Airborne. Eventually, he would become a regimental commander down in Fort Benning, uh, 
become part of the 82nd Airborne. And along with Ridgeway, he would fight at the front with his men, especially at Lafayette, which was a three-day battle that seesawed back and forth like Saw Americles, till finally on the third day, about uh, June the 8th, the Americans secured the area, but not after heavily, heavy losses and support from tanks and the 91st Division, which had also come ashore after the 4th Division. And Gavin is heavily honored in that area. If you ever go there, there's a wonderful statue to him. Gavin himself was a bit of a ladies' man. Uh, he at one point had dated the journalist Martha Gellhorn and had also become involved with the actress Marlena Dietrich. Dietrich. And I've got lots of good stories about him in the book, if you care to know more. And next slide, please. Excellent. Good point, Mitch. Meanwhile, the 101st Airborne is also in a horrible fight. They're liberating the village of Saint Marie du Mont, and that's along a main road that's heading to their main objective, which is the city of Carentan, one of the largest cities in the Normandy area. It was a dairy farming area. In fact, Carnation had a, a dairy plant there. And they were slowly creeping. Um, Taylor would be with the 101st, following them along the way. And again, just to reiterate the theme of the book, both Ridgeway and Taylor, despite being the commanding officers, despite being major generals, were in the thick of the fight. And early on June 6, neither Taylor or Ridgeway knew what the other was doing. And the reason being is a lot of the signal equipment, including radios, had been lost. They had fallen into the water, and there was very little communication between the two divisions. Really, not until late in the 6th and early on the 7th were they able to communicate. But the 101st, the Screaming Eagles, worked their way towards Caratan and would eventually liberate the, uh, the city, which would allow um, the 4th Division and the 91st Division to advance and other divisions to eventually uh, capture Sherborne. Next slide. So I've given you a quick, uh, exhausting overview, not only of the book, but what happens. And just summarizing, as I pointed out earlier, the Operation Overlord, especially for the Airborne, wasn't just a June 6 attack. It wasn't just a June 6 battle. Both the 82nd and the 101st had done so well, had organized so well, that General Bradley had asked that they stay in and continue to fight as infantry divisions, and they would continue on through July 13th before they were pulled from the lines and sent back to England. And to summarize just the, what these men consisted of, a little more than 13,000 paratroopers. They flew over in more than 800 C-47s. Later on, more than 700 gliders. About 3,900 troops came over in gliders. The air crew, the C-47 pilots, who we haven't even talked about, who went through immense training and later on would receive a significant amount of criticism for dropping the men far from the drop zones, which was unfair. Unfortunately, the late Stephen Ambrose was one of the ones that kind of uh, uh, got that idea going that the uh, airborne troops were dropped far from their uh, drop zones because of pilot error. The fact of the matter is without having any kind of fighter escort, going through the flak, not having proper radar, it was an almost impossible mission. Certainly not as bad as a Trapper Lee Mallory had thought, but still right. between the two divisions, more than a thousand were killed, 2,600 wounded, and more than 4,500 were missing. Most of them were POWs. And I should say that the paratroopers had been trained in escape and evasion. So not all of them, but many of the missing who had been captured by uh, the Germans were able to escape through the help of um, French citizens. So that's a quick, uh, almost an hour overview of the two airborne divisions at Normandy. And if anyone has any questions, or Jimmy, if you have any more, we'll be happy to uh, try and answer them.
No, that's that's a uh, that's that's a great review of of uh, sections of the book, and I think everybody's really going to be interested to get their hands on this. I know I enjoyed it. Um, I have tons of questions for you, and I like to really get up with you a little bit later down the road. But um, I think we could probably open it up to um, our online guests and uh, see if anybody has anything. Uh, Abby, do uh, we have anybody that's posted any any questions in chat, or if if they please. haven't uh, and you're listening, please do so. Um, we should be happy to answer any questions you do have. We don't have any so far. Um, so maybe in the meantime, while we're waiting for some, Jimmy, do you have a question or two that you want to throw out there? Sure. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, on Ridgeway's final attacks, uh, one of the last chapters you had in the book, Mitch, um, do you think Ridgeway was really in a position to defer uh, the tax, or do you think he really felt the pressure to continue on? Um, the 82nd spent what, 33 days in combat, no ground gain was ever lost, no resupply of men. Um, they had equipment uh, supply. It um, was a tough forego. Do you, do you think there was pressure on Ridgeway to continue? Do you think this paratroopers really could do it? That's a, it's an excellent question. Both Taylor and Ridgeway, in the initial briefing, the initial planning for Operation Neptune, the part of the airborne attack, which included the amphibious landing, was just those initial. Uh, objectives that I talked about, open up the causeways, uh, secure the bridges, confuse the heck out of the Germans, and then your job is done, even though they're going to fight as infantry. But what happens is the fighting is a lot tougher, and not just for the airborne, but for all of the Allied troops. You know, again, right. we think of June 6th, and we think of you know the longest day, which is the German quote that, you know, if, if we don't get the tanks there to block the um, Allied landings on all of the beaches, the five landing beaches, it's going to be a long day. Well, the Germans weren't able to block the landings. We know that um, Adolf Hitler, being the micromanager that he was, was the only one that could actually deploy the tanks and more troops to Normandy. He was still convinced early on that the landings at Normandy were a diversion and that really the main attack was going to take place elsewhere, probably, as I've mentioned, in the Pas de Calais. But meanwhile, the German troops that were there, and as I, I mentioned, those uh, divisions and regiments were good crack troops, and they fought extremely hard. And then eventually in the days after June 6, when it was realized that's where the attack is going to be, and that's where it's coming from. And once the beaches are secured, more and more allies are going to come over. The Germans put up one heck of a fight. And so the fighting continued. And it was really, um, I've used this term before, but it's a good description. It was a slugfest. And it took more than 30 days before Normandy was secured and the breakout. And so the airborne troops, the 82nd and 101st, who were hoping to go back to England and did their job, were told, you've got to stick around. Ridgway was not exactly happy about this, but he was told, you've got to stick around. We need you. Your troops are now experienced. you know." And the same thing with 101st. Almost all of those guys had not fought before, but now That's they've the become combat. combat veterans. And they're needed as the fighting continues um, slugging their way through through Cherbourg. So neither of the officers were entirely happy about it. Um, but that was the nature of the attack. And Eisenhower and Montgomery and Bradley, they needed the airborne there. Right. Thank you. Uh, Abby, do we have any questions come up? Uh, we did, yes. Jesse asked. What did the paratroopers wish they could have had with them in combat? That's an excellent question. Um, after the battle and even after the war, there were all kinds of um, 
surveys that were done, audits, as we like to say in the government of the Air Board, what they could have done, what they could have, um, what could have been, you know, what they could have used. And for the most part, they were very well equipped. They had the right weapons. So it wasn't so much of a matter of um, not having the right supplies, the right tools. It was the fact of being dropped far from the drop zones and the fact of being somewhat disorganized early on. Was there a way to get them as more of a cohesive unit early on? The one thing, though, that some of the airborne, the paratroopers complained about, and that goes back to my point a few moments ago about the C-47 pilots, and that's where Stephen Ambrose got this. Uh, Ambrose, who I don't want to criticize because he was a brilliant historian and a brilliant writer, his book on D-Day and certainly his book on Pegasus Bridge and um, his book on the 101st Airborne, which really got people interested he interviewed a lot of the veterans well after the war, of course, at reunions and so forth. And some of them got into their mind that it was the pilots that were inferior, they hadn't had enough training, and they were the problem. So some of them complained that they wished they had had better air support in terms of the pilots and the crew. And I and that's been debunked pretty much by the the Air Force that the pilots were very well trained, they did the best they could. It was just the circumstances. So to answer Jesse's question, I think most of them would say we wish we had better C-47 pilots and navigators. There's a lot of variables in there, Jesse. Um, you know those guys they did practice uh, the routes, uh, timing. Of course, as as Mitch said. You know, there's uh, there's darkness. The pathfinders didn't hit where they were supposed to, or couldn't get their equipment lit. Um, you know, the Eureka uh, and Rebecca uh, transmitters and receivers that was brand new too. You know, that's new technology. So they're trying something um, in the heat of combat, and so uh, to beat up the poor pilots. I'm I'm not so sure. I'm kind of with Mitch on that, but. Good question, Jesse. Thank you. Have any more? Point out, and I go into this a little bit in the book. There were a number of uh, exercises, three main exercises. The biggest one, Eagle, um, in England, where they practiced landing into drop zones and so forth. And they didn't go entirely well in England as well. Um, so right. it, it was it was a very tough exercise. And that's going back to Trafford Lee Mallory. That's one of the main reasons why he was so nervous. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, we do have a few more. Um, Miriam said, fascinating presentation. Did the paratroopers receive language training or were French speakers selected? Uh, excellent question, question, Miriam. And I should point out that Miriam is a colleague of mine and a very good friend. She's our public affairs officer at the National Archives brilliant at her job and she's one of the reasons why I'm speaking here tonight. Um, great question and the answer is there were um, officers who were trained to speak French. There were a number of them that could also speak German so when they captured German POWs they can interrogate them. Maxwell Taylor was one of them as I mentioned earlier he was fluent in Japanese. He also knew Italian. He knew a French. He had that ability that I wish I had that he could pick up languages. So yes, there were um, authors. I think we lost some audio on. Uh oh, Mitch, are you still there with us? I can see him. I'm not sure if his audio is working. Maybe also, to kind of chime in on Mitch there, you know, the paratroopers were also issued phrase book uh, for wherever they were going, whether it be uh, France, Germany. And so they had the opportunity to learn a little bit on their own um, to try to communicate. Are you there, Mitch? <laughs> 
Thank you, Jimmy. Um, Absolutely. Good point, Jimmy. Um, oh, good. I am. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we I can. can. See you now. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, we have two more, more questions. Yes. Okay. Um, Paul, got time Paul, for asked, Paul asked, was there anything that surprised you or that was unexpected that you found in your research? Nice. Uh oh, I think we lost. I think me. my connection is starting to fail us, unfortunately. Maybe that and, time uh, of evening. Can everybody's. You hear me? That's okay. Um, I think we'll we'll give them a couple um, more seconds. There we go. Okay. Mitch, are you still there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, do you want to answer Paul's question or do you want to yeah, go ahead and. I'm afraid I didn't hear it. Can you repeat it? Oh, sure. Um, was there anything that surprised you or uh, that was unexpected that you found in your research? There is. It is something that I didn't talk about today, but one of my favorite stories from the book is the guy named Colonel Barney Oldfield. And he was like Miriam, a public affairs officer for um, the Army and then the Army Air Forces. And he recruited a number of journalists to jump um, with the Airborne, both the 82nd and the 101st, so they can get the stories. Uh, General Eisenhower, um, who we could talk about for hours, was very, very adamant that communication between the military and the civilians back home, families especially, knew what was going on. And so he wanted as much as he could to give the war correspondents a free reign and to give them access to the front lines. And along with his uh, public affairs officer, um, Oldfield, they came up with the idea of dropping the journalists. And I have a pretty good section, I think, on that in the book. And it's one of my favorite parts. And he's He's a real character. So if you're interested in that aspect, I urge you to read the book, if nothing else, for that chapter. It was a great chapter, yes. Any, we any have, more questions, uh, Abby? Yeah, we have one more. And okay. I'm sorry if I, I pronounced this incorrectly, but Bill asked, can you please discuss the fighting at the Lafier Bridge? F-I-E-R-E. Yep, Lafayette, and okay. the fighting at Lafayette would be considered almost the Gettysburg um, for the 82nd Division. The fact that the fighting took more than three days, and it's kind of the, this. You, you, I think that Jimmy would agree, when you look at the legacy of the 82nd Division, even beginning with World War I, the, if you're in the 82nd, you have to know about Lafayette. And it's one of those places where you need to visit. It's it's well marked. There are a number of private memorials. Um, this is where James Gavin, uh, Slim Jim Gavin, as he was known, would lead the troops from the front. And Ridgeway was there as well. And it was important that that bridge, the Lafayette Bridge, which went over part of the river in that area and the causeway, had to be taken that first day. If it was lost to the Germans, it's quite possible that the 4th Division and later the 91st Division would have been driven back. And it's a complicated battle. And, um, you know, somebody asked about what my favorite part of the book was. I would say writing about Lafayette not, it was also one of the more interesting parts, but it was also the most difficult. And I've been to the site more than once. And I have to be honest with you, I still don't understand the battle thoroughly. And I'm not sure if I know anybody that does. There is a wonderful um, documentary that you can watch on Amazon. But it took three days of heavy fighting of the regiments of the 82nd. Some of these men had to come from great distance where they had fallen in the marshes, had dropped far from some of the drop zones. And the Germans were not willing to give up. Some of the men, um, 
led by um, a battalion commander by the name of Timms. They were caught in an orchard nearby and trapped. It was almost similar to the Lost Battalion uh, episode of, of World War I. Uh, I could talk about this for a long period. It's an excellent question, but it's a very complicated battle. But in the end, it was almost a draw. And in the sense, the Germans did withdraw from that area and the Americans were able to take over. Had they not won that battle on that day and had lost, it would be interesting. It's one of those what ifs in history. What would have happened to the rest of the campaign within those days? And how would the fighting have gone? Very true. And there was elements of every regiment from the division there at one point trying to get across that that narrow narrow bridge um, and with the tank sitting on top of it too. Right. In fact, the 82nd's only uh, Medal of Honor recipient for Normandy, the Galloper, was awarded that for his action. He was in a actual glider infantry regiment. They were glider units that were converted into, into infantry regiments, and he was able to help get his men across the river and across the bridge. And there was heroism everywhere in that battle, including Kellum, who the bridge is named for. Uh, but this is really where um, Gavin would make his mark. And this is the experience of the war that he thought about significantly for the rest of his life. Awesome. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening. And yeah. should you have any uh, questions later on that you think about, um, give Jimmy a call at any time, uh, middle of the night. He'll be happy to answer <laughs> or he'll pass a truth. And again, uh, um, thank you all, those of you who have served in the military uh, in your special day tomorrow. I'll be thinking about you. Yeah. Thank you all to who attended out there in the virtual world. Um, we appreciate your questions and your comments. Um, really appreciated. Um, we hope everybody's able to visit the museum soon uh, and definitely pick up a, book, a copy of Mitch's book. Uh, you will not be uh, disappointed. It's, it's a great read. There's some great images and pictures. Uh, I, I learned a, a bunch of it uh, just reading through. So um, on behalf of the ASOM staff and the foundation, um, we'd like to thank our veterans for their service and uh, hope to have a great Veterans Day tomorrow. I uh, want everybody to stay safe out there and um, take care. Thank you again. Thank you, Mitch. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. All right.